one. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us for our World of Work seminar with Toby Shapshak. This is the third event that we are hosting, and we're delighted to be back again. We've had a little bit of a break with the, with the holidays. We hope that you are all keeping well and safe. Um, I think you've all gone back to school again now, the kids that are joining us on the call. So we hope that your first day back at school has gone well. We are really excited today um, to be talking a little bit about something that's been quite topical at Kura recently. We've uh, recently launched an esports program, both with Minecraft esports um, and, and traditional esports as well. And we've been having lots of conversations about esports can be used as an extramural, but there's so many opportunities, uh, you know, for for careers, both you know the back end and producing esports, but also playing. So Toby today is going to be talking a little bit about um, Twitch and can you actually make a career out of Twitch um, and streaming, and also about how, why and how you should keep social media clean, which I think is pertinent um, not just for the kids on the call, but for all of us adults. So Toby, we are delighted to have you back with us again today, just as a sort of quick brief introduction in case we've got parents and, and learners joining us for the first time. Uh, Toby is the editor in chief of and publisher of Stuff Magazine. Um, he's done numerous things um, in the technology space. He is a Forbes contributor. He's done TED Talks. So uh, Toby, thank you so much for joining us again and over to you. Thank you very much for having me and hello everybody who's doing this on a cold Monday night. I'm going to share my slides uh, right this moment. Um, there we go. That should be what you're all seeing. Um, and we've been looking at the way work is going to fundamentally change because social media didn't exist 15 years ago and all of a sudden there are a bunch of careers in that community managers, social editors, uh, creators, influencers. And we're gonna just look at all of the social media landscape out there and how I think it's gonna be changing in the near future. But first, uh, there's a lovely view of our stuff studios in Bromfontein. Um, but first, a little bit of news. And I'm sure you've noticed that there's a new space race. And this one is between the billionaires. Uh, as you can see, Richard Branson got there first with, with Virgin Galactic, and uh, he was followed by Jeff Bezos over there in the bald head. The woman above him is truly amazing. Wally Funk is her totally cool name. She was one of the original Mercury 13 woman astronauts who, who qualified to fly in the 1960s. The Mer Mercury 7 were the first astronauts, John Glenn, Alan Shepard. Alan Shepard is, is, is who that spaceship they're in is named for um, the new shepherd. And on the left, <laughs> wearing the Dutch flag on his shoulder, is an 18 year old kid whose father runs a hedge fund and bought him uh, the trip as a present, as a surprise. And he, he, uh, he happened to tell Jeff Bezos that he's never bought anything from Amazon, which of course was hilarious. Uh, what was not so much was that Jeff Bezos thanked all the staff at Amazon for paying for all of this. Um, but I just want to say somewhat patriotically that actually we were there first and Mark Shuttleworth went up into space and had to learn Russian and train for 10 months and did it the hard way. In fact, uh, we've even put the first convertible in space, um, the famous uh, spaceman picture, Elon Musk's SpaceX lifted this up. So we was there first. Um, uh, up, up, you know, I don't know how many people saw last uh, the last event and I, I looked at this and I thought, you know, another way of looking at this is not just, a, you know, a catastrophe, but uh, the greatest marketing opportunity of all time. Who does not know who Evergreen is and the Ever Given? Um, and I, I really love this photograph, which just kind of seems to uh, epitomize the, the world at the moment, doesn't it? Where everything seems to be bearing down on us, not just from the, the COVID uh, pandemic, but the, the riots and the looting of this last month. Um, it's just great, a eh? sense of humor that people have for, uh, um, seeing things that happen to us and that's human nature right it allows us to bounce back doesn't it um so let's just look at the world that we live in right now because facebook has become the largest 
communication portal that the world has ever seen, or the largest communication mechanism. 2.4 billion people use it every day, and uh, one over a billion use Facebook Messenger, Instagram, and WhatsApp every day and every month. And it is really quite a behemoth. Twitter, um, you know, has a bit more of a quaint uh, attitude, but you know, if you're famous on a social media channel, you can you can really be famous. I mean, you can you can be a cat with a perennial frown and be famous, uh, but just as easily um, you can be infamous. And this this woman is in many ways kind of ground zero of a of a very strange and horrible form of shaming that went online, and and it just goes to show. Um, that a sense of humor and a sense of irony and certainly a sense of sarcasm never communicates well uh, in Twitter or in any kind of text message. So uh, lots of people do strange things to become famous, right? Remember this woman, the, the alleged mother of the alleged uh, decuplets. Um, who never knew that word before that? I did not either. Um, so <laughs> talking of, of grumpy cats, I had this very funny experience at a at a place called South by Southwest. It's a big conference in Austin, Texas, and all the big tech companies go. Uh, it's where the idea for Uber came about because it's impossible to catch a taxi. It's where Twitter launched themselves. And I was walking past this, uh, this kind of raised platform you can see, and there were all these people milling around. And I it was back in the days when I still had a proper camera with a lens and uh, and I stood there to see what was going on and out came this funny looking guy. Uh, and then I took a picture of him and his, you know, startled looking cat. Didn't look very grumpy there. Uh, and turned to the woman next to me and said to her, who is that? And she looked at me like I was a total moron and went, duh, it's grumpy cat. So that's how uh, I met grumpy cat. But, you know, it just shows you how simple and vacuous it is to be some kind of social media star, you know, Kim Kardashian tried to break the internet. Um, I thought that was really hilarious while looking for pictures. I found this one I thought was really great. I thought this was probably the funniest of all of them because, you know, someone with great talent and a great sense of humor like, you know, uh, Suzelle can have multiple careers on social media because she has talent and she's smart and she's interesting and she got her own Showmax series. I mean, that's pretty remarkable coming from YouTube to something significant like this, but it is because she has talent and she reads the market really correctly. You know, a, a lot is made of this guy, uh, Tyler Ninja Blevins, who is a, who is a, um, a well-known gamer and he makes a small fortune uh, it turns out something like 50 million dollars he doesn't make that every year but he makes a small fortune being on twitter it was like a million dollars a year was how um uh, it was initially described he was lured to twitch he was lured back uh to twitch after he left for another streaming service and he is one of the people that everyone always talks about and says, look, you can be you can be rich and famous and you can make a total living being a uh, just a um, uh, an Insta Instagram influencer or a Twitch gamer or something like that. And it's it's unfortunately what too many people think about in the world and think that it's really easy to go uh, from uh, playing games or, you know, being a gamer to being the kind of success that this guy is. Because, you know, if you look at the most viewed video on uh, YouTube, it's Baby Shark. You know, it's not, it would not appear, you know, if we, if we were sending um, uh, spaceships into space with recordings of humanity's finest moments, this would not be one of it. And yet it just shows you the kind of fickle nature of the internet and what will become famous. I mean, this was this was when an egg <laughs> became the most uh, liked Instagram post of all time. I mean, it's just completely insane that that is what we've got to. And of course, more people than ever aspire to be TikTok stars uh, or Instagram stars or Snapchat stars. If anyone even you know hangs out on Snapchat anymore, but the question is famous for what? Because what we're seeing is the death 
of the influencer. There's a massive shift coming in social media where being an influencer is no longer going to be just as easy as it was. And part of the reason is that there's a huge clampdown coming on the social networks. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, all of them are going to see in YouTube and, and uh, several others are going to see an enormous amount of uh, legislation coming their way because what has fundamentally happened is that it's become a way to spread disinformation and it's become quite dangerous and diabolical uh, to the point where uh, the Australian government um, you know had to appeal to Facebook this is just a few days ago to stop sp spreading disinformation about the Sydney lockdown or as Newsweek reported uh, uh, makubang is a is a um, the Korean word for an influencer. So it's there she is trying to eat an octopus, a live octopus. Uh, she has to warn her viewers that it's not something you should do at home because you know a lot of people uh, choke from trying to swallow a live octopus, which obviously tries to come out. And this is this is the world that social media have created and it's not going to stay like this for a long time. This is the US president talking about social media. They are killing people. And this is this is what the the very tech savvy new president of America understands about the social networks. He's, he's not going to push a strange conspiracy that conservative voices are being uh, being um, censored. And he really is quite clear what's going to happen. But what happens over at Facebook? What does Mark Zuckerberg do straight after the US president says uh, they are killing people? This is what the CEO of Facebook says. And this is just a real problem for everybody in the world because this is the man who's supposed to be doing something about it. And this is, you know, if you think you can leave school and start a career where you can be some kind of influence on Instagram, or WhatsApp or, or Twitch, you have to be very conscious of what are, what are the problems going on, which is the, net, the, the social media networks are getting a massive backlash from the US government. I mean, this is just a quick example of, you know, the th th four of the largest messaging services in the world are controlled by one company. Uh, who are who is unelected? Um, all of these have over a, a million, a billion users. Facebook has over 2.4 billion users, and the problem really is that they are becoming more and more divisive. Uh, what we also know um, is that they are not as popular as uh, people used to find them. Facebook, especially, is not being read and used by people in the young age group, you know, this very key young group. Look at this, uh, the graph on the right. You can see uh, people in Instagram at the most are like, you know, 40. Uh, Facebook, the average age is 69. It's a very worrying statistic, as is this one for Facebook, because it shows you just where people are using it and what they're doing it. So you want to become a, a, a TikTok star. The chances are by the time you you know, you're 20 or you're 25, there may be an entirely different um, form of social media. If you if you think you can be an influencer, you have to be really clear about what it is. Instagram is is Snapchat still there, but it's it's uh, it's usage is falling. TikTok is climbing. Everybody now wants to be a clubhouse influencer. And the problem is, all of this targeted advertising as we carried on stuff is separating us they it's it's making us more and more divisive as we saw during these really terrible riots in our country you know so so what we've seen is that the influencer market is 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 going away there's a real problem in terms of the likes uh, the like button is being uh, uh, taken away more and more and more from social media because of mental health issues and it turns out that actually this is what the social networks will respond to, that there's mental health issues. This is a fascinating article I read in Harper's Magazine, one of the great uh, journalistic uh, publications that do these very deep, uh, uh, in-depth articles. And this one was about what happened during lockdown in 
what happened in lockdown during uh, in the states in in Los Angeles, where all of these new kind of TikTok mansions were were developing, and you'd go and you'd live there, and you'd have to do two or three videos a week. And this is, you know, in many minds, this idea of this new idea of the creator. So the in, the influencer is is a business model or a, a career or something that's being fa that's fading away, and partly, you know. Of their own mistake, you know. The the problem is that a lot of in, uh, influencers did not, or so-called influencers, did not reveal that they were taking money for prompting someone else. And human nature is just, you know, people understand it. If you lie or deceive, they get it. They will understand it. If you're not being authentic, which is the word of the day, they're totally going to get that. And part of that problem means that you, you know, if you don't tell people as so many influencers do, and then you get caught out, it's really problematic. You saw what happened with with uh, uh, Twitter bots during the riots in KZN, lots of them doing things that weren't good. So along comes this new idea of the creator economy, and it's a new big word, and this is what's going to happen. And the New Yorker, another great publication, did a really good story on it, and it basically said, it's just turning digital content into gig work because that's the other business model that's been debunked uh, through COVID is that, you know, if you're an Uber driver, the, 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 the myth Uber sells is that you can make lots of money and work your own hours, et cetera, et cetera. It's not been the reality for the vast majority of people who've worked as ride sharing drivers. And in fact, what really just happened was if you worked for a company and you were a driver or a, t a taxi driver, you would be given a car and petrol and insurance for the car. You'd be given days of leave. You'd be given uh, sick leave if you need it. You'd contribute to a pension plan. There'd be a whole bunch of things that a company would do for you because you would do uh, a, a job for them. Basically, what the gig economy and Uber and Lyft and all of these companies did was instead of buying the car and the insurance and paying for the petrol, it just turned handed that over to the person who was doing it without any of the up, upside and out any of the reward. And in fact, Uber and Lyft have always been unprofitable, which is a it's a worrying sign. So along comes this creator economy and people are thinking this is great. You can support people through Patron, the website that's that lets you subscribe to someone's content or pay stuff. But actually, as this article talks about, it's really talking about uh, turning people into more cogs in a vast machine. I'm going to leave that up just for a second because it's a very interesting description, especially the first three or four sentences. So suddenly there's this idea of the social media influencer is no longer there and now it's going to be the creator. And of course, there's a lot of excitement about this because according to CB Insights, the the creator economy is a potential uh, boom. It, it, it saw $1.3 billion in funding in 2012 alone. Now, you just need to remember that this funding is not necessarily going to the creators themselves. It's going to platforms that monetize what the creators do. So just like social media influencers were earning a small percentage, the tip of the iceberg, the, the unseen vast amount of income was coming from, was going to the social platforms or the advertising uh, companies that underpin them. And, you know, it's, there's, there, is there a difference? I mean, there's, you know, there's a difference, perhaps uh, influencers are already famous, creators are striving to be, uh, as this woman told the, the, um, the New Yorker, she's a, she's a partner in this Lightspeed Venture Partners, and they've invested in Cameo. A lot of people may know that well. It's a video editing tool for Instagram, lets you do really cool things, very good pictures, and OutSchool, which is a, a marketplace for selling online education. Another guy who also founded an investment firm um, talks about how they will be, you know, anyone who makes their money from the from the internet is is you know is is a part of this creator economy, but it is a bit of a misnomer because, you know, if you kind of watch it, it's kind of like watching this television pattern, which my sister and I honestly used to watch back in 1976 when television only started at 6 p.m. and was only on for a couple of hours, um, and it was watching, you know, just this 
this, you know, if you take a step far back enough from so much of the social media use stuff, it's not very different because what are people wanting to be famous for? You know, are you going to be famous for uh, being, you know, a young guy who dances around in front of a video with someone else? You don't actually do anything brand new. You haven't written a song. It's not like MTV when it first came out was so famous because musicians would do things and they'd become extraordinarily famous and the records would sell. This current generation of TikTok, TikTok and social media stars are really trying to just be famous for being thin and good looking and lying around and having a great lifestyle. I just don't, I don't get it. You know, I think people should be famous for doing amazing things and doing incredible achievements like this really, really extraordinary man who mobilized his community in Soweto to protect Maponya Mall from looters last week. Now, he didn't set out to be a social media star. He did something amazing and he became known because of that. Similarly, you know, how do you know if you're going to be a social media star how much of an income you can possibly make. This is one really fantastic story. Uh, uh, you know, a guy who had 170,000 followers uh, happened to see uh, a piano and, and Instagrammed uh, a quick video of him and this guy made, you know, $60,000. But that's that's the, the kind of um, the exception to the rule that just doesn't happen as often as everything else does. And of course, the planet has gone through this massive economic crisis called COVID, which means so many people haven't been able to do the things that they would normally do. Um, but there is hope. We are starting to have a vaccine rollout. I've had mine, my wife's had mine, had hers, sorry. Everyone in our household by the end of August will be fully vaccinated, having two jabs. That really does mean something significant in terms of how the world is going to be. So what does it mean? Well, it means if you want to be a, 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 an Instagram influencer or you want to be someone on Twitch who earns a lot of money, the first thing you've got to do is be good. And when I was talking, uh, thinking about this, I remembered the words of a friend of mine and he says he does a lot of television production. His name's Glenn van Lochenberg and his advice to talent is show up and be good. If you're the talent, that's your job. Your job is to be there and to be good. And I think that's great life advice. You know, do you want to be famous for, you know, protecting your community or do you want to be famous for dancing to, you know, someone else's song? I mean, those, you know, the, the variety of wonderful Jerusalem and knockoffs are really fantastic. But at the end of the day, you know, the person who's the most famous is the DJ who mixed it and the woman who sang it. I mean, this is a this is what they are famous for. They're not famous for, you know, coming up with a bit of a dance, although that, you know, that was really fantastic. So who is Glenn and what does he do? Well, he produces massive things like that. Uh, the dome in the bottom right hand, he does a lot of brilliant work for uh, DSTV and Multichoice. That's a uh, uh, um, Augment, augmented reality uh, depiction of um, Trevor Noah, that huge dome was for Mnet's 30th um, hologram, uh, Mnet's 30th uh, anniversary. And they, he, they built, he built this massive dome and had this huge thing and filled Trevor Noah in New York doing this kind of thing. But what's most remarkable about Glenn, who is a brilliant businessman and creative, is that all he ever wanted to do was be a DJ. And there he is DJing for, you know, thousands again and living his life like a DJ. And, and, you know, what does he do when he is in front of the camera? He shows up and he's good. So that's the best advice I can give to anybody who wants to have a career in social media. Do something that is worth being famous for. Do something that people will find aspirational and be authentic. Don't do it because, uh, you, you know, you want to live in a, a TikTok mansion. That's not real life. You want to do something in life and be famous for something that is really fantastic. Um, this has been the world of work. And if there are any questions or anything we'd like to ask, uh, I'm going to be available after this. And I thought I should just add one final little reminder of what success looks like, because we all think, you know, it's some easy strate strategy that, you know, you do something once and the next thing you're famous. Actually, as they say in the tech startup space, uh, you spend, you know, 10, 20 years 
uh, working really hard to be suddenly successful. So if there are any questions, please let me know. Thank you so much, Toby. And I think it really does make one wonder what we're, you know, what we're heading for in the next 20 years or 10 years with social media, doesn't it? Um, it does. I, yeah, I, I, um, I read uh, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century by Yuval Harari a little while ago. And, um, you know, wh wh while I read that book, I just constantly thought about my five-year-old daughter and, you know, what does this mean for her? How do, how do I prepare her for this world out there? And I think it's, you know, it links back to something that you said about sort of just show up and be good. And, and I think we've got to find more meaning from social media than just pure acknowledgement. Um, we, you know, there are better ways to find sort of acknowledgement as a human being. So, um, so that was really, really good food for thought. Um, if there are any questions, you're welcome to pose them in the chat. I actually have a question for you, Toby, if any, while well, anybody's Thanks. thinking. Um, how, you know, things may change exponentially. As we know, they've already changed exponentially in the last 20 years. What do you think our kids should be doing and um, preparing for sort of a potential social media career that we don't really sort of know about yet? Um, well, I mean, the... The, the flippant answer I want to say is learn to use punctuation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I am an editor and I have a degree in English and I've been a journalist for most of my life. So uh, I'm still someone who types full sentences. Um, I mean, I suppose that's advice for any job interview. You know, remember the age of the people you're dealing with and treat them the way you think they would want you to behave in a, in a work environment. You know, um, I remember being on a, on a chat group with a, someone much 20 years younger who's spoken this, and I said to her, it's not professional. You can't speak like, you can't use tech speak. So, so if you want to be in social media, and I think it's going to be around, but it's going to be around in a much more different way. I, I, I hope I didn't crush anybody's um, uh, spirits or dreams or aspirations, but um, um, if you aspire to just be famous for the sake of being famous, then I, then I, I hope I inspired you to do something better and, and, and more worthwhile. But, you know, the, the thing is, is that whatever our careers will be, they will involve some form of digital sharing. I mean, it's, it's not going to just go away. I mean, there's a, there's a massive change that's coming in terms of advertising and how advertising is, is targeted towards us. Apple is refusing to let people track you on their iPhones. Uh, Google's doing something similar with their Android phones. And there's this vast uh, network of digital advertising networks that operate in the background um, that prey on all of this information about us. So, you know, you don't don't sell yourself short, literally, you know, don't give everything away on social media. You know, you re firstly retain some privacy and secondly, you know, mm. if you've got a great dance uh, version of Jerusalem, you know, aspire to be the DJ who makes it, not the people who mimic the dance. You copy it. <laughs> Yeah, yes. absolutely. And I, and I think um, we're actually focusing quite a lot on digital citizenship with our teachers this coming term. And I think I think it's important to understand the implications of all of this. Like, you know, what are you signing up to when you when you join all of these um, social media networks? Yeah. Indeed, um, you know, I mean, my son is four years old and one of the one of the reasons we haven't created a social network, not only because, you know, we worried about uh, people preying on him or something like that, but because we want him to have his own digital identity. When he comes of age, we don't want him to inherit, you know, all the pictures. And I have a friend who did this really, really brilliant page about her daughter and as she grew up, it was witty and funny and hilarious. Everyone knew it was the mother, not the father, even though the father is the bigger character. It was really lovely. But I mean, I, I, in a way, I just thought, Mm. it's not that 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 person's going to come of age and they're going to have this whole identity that has nothing to do with them. You know, I I was always, oh, you're Leon's son or Sylvia's son, oh, your grandfather's Rene, you know, and I, I never wanted that. I mean, I, they weren't particularly famous, but um, in the Jewish community, everybody knows everybody. And you, you just, you want someone to be their own mm. person. You know, we can show, we can show our children the, the, the handrails to life, but mm. not tell them which direction to take. 
absolutely. And actually sort of thinking back to that book um, that I mentioned, I think that's the thing with AI as well is is making sure that your children have got strength of character to not have the AI manipulate them to know that they yeah. can still make their own decisions. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So we've got a few questions here and they're kind of linked and sort of linked to what I also asked. So I'm going to ask all three of them, and then you can respond. Uh, right. So the first is knowing all of this, where do you start with your children? Um, and then I'm going to come back to that one. And then how does this link to school and education as we know it? Um, and then I'll ask the rest just now. So let's start with okay. that. So, so in terms of school and education, I think the hardest thing for, for parents to understand, remember that a generation is considered 20 years. So if you are 20 when you have your child, you are a generation older than them. If you're 30, you're half a If you're in your 40s, you're a generation. I mean, you know, so 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 much changes in 20 years, in five years, in, in 10. I mean, we're living at a, at a pace. So we, as older people, we don't, we look at, we always look at people younger than us and go, what a waste of their time and look at people older than us and go, why won't they move with the times, you know? Um, so younger people are always technologically more savvy than, than anyone else. And there's always the assumption that everybody makes that my experience is, is obviously more legitimate than everybody else's. Therefore, the way I've experienced technology or growing up must be the right way. Uh, it's a it's a kind of behavioral consumer bias. Uh, um, uh, I forget the sudden phrase perception bias, but it's uh, so so confirmation bias. So so we always think we've we know better than our children. Our children always think they know better than us. Um, and we've got to kind of get somewhere in the middle. And, and to the first question, what does it mean? Well, it's parenting in every way it's always was. You know, I've I've kind of watched my parents. My mother's 93. Um, and I've watched the way her and my father straddled their generation of being parents and my brothers and sisters. I remember growing up, my brother had a Super 8 in his in his Capri, you know, like uh, only old people like me will even remember what a Super 8 was, bigger than a cassette tape, you know. And, and um, what was I listening to the other day where the, there was a song where I've got a cassette tape in my pocket. You know, it was a, it, the technology changes. So for all the people, it's really hard to understand that younger people have a meaningful existence with text mm. messaging. Like I'm of the generation that likes to call. I, I, I deal with people who never want to speak to someone on a telephone. What old fogies do that, you know? Mm. Uh, even the word funky is no longer cool. Um, <laughs> I, th I think that happened a while ago, actually. Yes, yes, yes. I know, I know. <laughs> dope is it. It's dope now. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, we we watch you know the kids sort of building teams on on Microsoft Teams or sort of other platforms. They're from different schools. They've never met each other, and I'm sort of watching how they're building this you know this relationship and they're they're arranging social plans and they do they do have meaningful experiences. I think we've got to think about how we manage that and find balance. Yeah. But they do have meaningful experiences. Yeah. Um. What do you think of people who make a living off live streaming? And in fact, we touched on Twitch a little bit earlier, and we've been having lots of chats about this um, at Kuro with our live streaming of esports. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that too. Yeah, good for them. You know, I think it's fantastic that people can be, can make a living from doing what they're good at. I think of, you know, my schooling and education, I studied English and journalism, but you know, most of the way through high school, I had no vision for what I wanted to do and no sense of where I was going to go so that people have an idea that that they can. That's fantastic. But, you know, if you if you can now, I mean, what the, the other good thing is back then you couldn't make money. Now you can. Now you can be good at something that doesn't require you to run around outside and be a jock. Uh, given that so many schools, certainly when I was at school, were so sports orientated as literature kids or arty kids had no place. Um, but now we live in an age where you can make a really good living being a really good gamer or, um, oh, I've just forgotten his name, is this brilliant, we were interviewed him for the TV show, a uh, young, young guy who uh, was the first a cyber athlete or athlete, cyber athlete to be sponsored by Red Bull in the Southern Hemisphere. And he, and he went and entered a, a, a FIFA game and he hoped he would win enough money 
to play the next version of the game. And instead, he, I think he won 100,000 rand and he's famous and he got interviewed on TV. And, you know, but, but what did he do? The first thing he did was play really well and be good at what he did. And that's at the end of the day, all we can do to teach our children is to do what you do, do it really well. And if you're really good and really passionate, something about that comes through. You know, we, we need more mm. um, people of with passion than we need, you know, drones. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and there's so many skills that come along with those things and playing, you know, playing games, uh, requires a lot of strategic thinking and conflict resolution and negotiation and all of those things that you know our kids need to 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 function in the real world yeah um, indeed and in fact the thing about gaming that's so interesting is even if you're not a good gamer but you're a good caster which is the phrase yeah. for parents broadcast yeah. you can you know the RT kids can become casters i've seen this in several schools or you know uh, someone who wants to keep track of the scoring i mean when I was a kid, that was just, you know, the poor guy who had to do the cricket scoring was the last one out the room. Um, yeah, I, I used to be a cricket me. scorer too. <laughs> well, and so linked to that, um, exploring with us progressive new career options, what subjects would reinforce those those choices? And before I hand it over to you, I think it's not even just the subjects, it's the opportunities that schools provide yeah. as well, um, beyond just your sort of traditional subjects and sort of finding, you know, we're talking about esports and stuff, getting involved in helping to stream and shoutcast and that sort of thing. Exactly. So so I, I'm just going to go back to the theme of, of where this started and our conversation, Angela, about why something like this would be helpful, we hope, for youngsters, which is... The grown-ups don't have the answers. The academics don't have, no one has the answers. We have, you know, I, I looked at a number of slides about AIs taking this person's job. Journalism, you know, Bloomberg is the best journalist organization in the world. They're like, they're the Usain Bolt of journalists. People who work for Bloomberg are like the best or the economist, you know, these are the top jobs in the world. Mm -hmm. Bloomberg, a third of all of the journalism, all of the content put out by Bloomberg is written by AI, by artificial intelligence, by a robot. You know, that's that's mm. my industry, that's journalism. So so what is it that's going to survive? What are the jobs that are going to be meaningful? What are the things our children are going to do? Well, they're the things that, that we don't know yet, but what we've got to do is teach them how to learn, teach them how to mm. adapt. Uh, my experience of running a business was watching my parents run their own business and swearing blind I'd never do it. And then I got retrenched two days after I got back from my first honeymoon and I kind of fell into doing it. I'm very lucky I have mm -hmm. a business partner like Sally Hudson who, you know, I don't speak maths as a first language, but she does. <laughs> and, you know, uh, it's been really just an interesting process of learning how to run a business and use common sense you know when my late brother died and i ran a construction company for six months i just used common sense and i suppose that's what i'm saying to other parents which is we don't really know we just have to make sure our children are good people they know right from wrong they have a good moral compass and a good understanding of the world and know when they're being taken advantage of all the gazillions of things that you know a parent has to spend 15 to 20 years instilling in a child um but those are the kinds of things that all parents have done. You know, at the end of the day, you can always see um, people who've had good, caring parents who've just taught them to be real and, you know, mm. look high when you speak to someone or, you know, just mm. have the right kind of uh, a, a, a sense of self-confidence. You know, at the end of the day, Angela, I thought so much about what, what if there was one thing I could instill in my son that I don't think I had as a, as a youngster. And I think that was self-confidence you know like mm. is there so much about the world that just beats you down especially when you're a teenager but if you know your parents love you and you know you're mm. good at what you know those are the things that are more important than social media likes uh, it's just really hard when you know the social media likes of the big shiny television and you're trying to get your kid to read um uh, a book as opposed to mm. <laughs> a bit mm. Yeah, and I I agree with you 100%, Toby. I think that's exactly it. I sort of was alluding to that earlier, that strength of character and, and being comfortable enough in who you are. Yeah. 
And I, I also wanted to say, I think to respond uh, to the subject question, I think it's also the opportunity to connect all of these different subjects together to then apply them, um, apply that knowledge to solve problems. So that's where things sort of, you know, that's where things come together is when we actually take what we've learned and solve some problems. Um, and I think that's what's important. So I know that you have got to go soon. So I am going to just. I have a 702 interview, but what I, I hope this has been meaningful and important to people. And if you need to get hold of me, Toby at stuff.co.za, uh, stuff.co.za is filled with useful advice for other people like me who are bluffing that they don't understand anything about mm -hmm. technology. Uh, I'll teach you how to bluff your way through a conversation <laughs> with a teenager. Um, it's all about the, the words, you know, if you want to speak like a, uh, um, um, a consultant I've worked it out is it's a just it's one word you don't say solve for you just solve you don't say solve the problem you say solve for the problem so if you want to <laughs> sound smart and like a consultant you just say solve for insert anything and any so so let's work out how we can solve for for uh, the problem <laughs> so and add an extra note onto the bill <laughs> Toby, thank you so much for joining us again this evening. We've got lots more questions. So I think what we'll do is we'll take these questions and we'll do a little article that we can share with our parents with some guidance. Great. So um, uh, thank please. you so much again, and we look forward to the next one. Great stuff. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Have a good evening and enjoy your chat over dinner.